and welcome. This is Business Edge on New Central. I'm Tolulokwe at Dele Rubalogun. Our headline story, World Bank's global economic prospects for January 2021. While the second wave and in some instances, a third wave of the coronavirus is spreading across the world, new protection is possible in the form of vaccines. But this is also happening while we're hearing that the World Bank has made bold projections of growth for Kenya, South Africa and Nigeria. We'll have a guest in to discuss that. We'll also touch base with a few stories we're keeping our eyes on with NC4 to watch before we finish the show. We're going to take a quick time out. When we come back, Business Edge continues. Stay with us. Now, the global economy is expected to expand by 4% in 2021. This projection is based on the initial COVID-19 vaccine rollout, which should become widespread throughout the year. The World Bank, in its January 2021 Global Economic Prospects, says that a recovery, however, will likely be subdued unless policymakers move decisively to tame the pandemic and implement investment-enhancing reforms. In sub-Saharan Africa, the economic activity in the region is on course to rise by 2.7% in 2021. The recovery is being led by Kenya with a growth projection of 6.9%. Kenya's rebound is expected to be slightly stronger, although below historical averages hinged on agricultural commodity exports. In South Africa, growth is expected to rebound to 3.3% in 2021, a 0.7 percentage points below previous forecast before softening to a near potential pace of 1.7% in 2022. Growth in Nigeria is expected to resume at 1.1% in 2021. Activity is, another, is nevertheless anticipated to be dampened by low oil prices, OPEC quotas, failing public investment due to weak government revenues, reduced private investments and subdued foreign investor confidence. These point to a better 2021, but all are hinged on adequate implementation of policies and firm political will by the governments of Kenya, South Africa, and Nigeria to implement them for the benefit of all. Now joining me on Business Edge is Ecos Apoko Bayan, Chief Investment Officer at Ovid Capita in Johannesburg, South Africa. Ecos, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so let's go and straight into the growth forecast, particularly for um, Kenya. It's at the highest at a 6.9%. What is expected to drive this particular growth that Kenya's anticipating seeing in 2021? Uh, from what we have seen, uh, the, what is driving Kenya's growth is that Kenya has been able to tap uh, solidly behind the uh, digital economy in Africa. They are the leading, they were they're the leading country in the continent, especially to tap um, for, for the lower stream of the market. Mm. So, so what King has done with, for example, with the Impasa, uh, every time you see in Kenya, it has about 50% of, of, of real money changing hand is going through the digital economy. Uh, it's not just in the upstream of the economy, but on the downstream. So you have 14 million Kenyans using that, and that has triggered growth, especially now that we're experiencing a uh, pandemic and there's been a lot of lockdowns. So people are able to transact and, and move, move, move a digital currency and transact uh, without seeing a person, and they trust this mode. Mm. And it's not just for sophisticated businesses, but for, for the common man, for the common person, for the common working class. And this has continued to steer Kenya's growth. And, and global international investors are seeing this, and uh, they are putting their bet on Kenya, and it's driving growth in Kenya, as we're seeing from the World Bank. Okay. So 6.9%, again, as we said, it's the highest for these three powerhouse economies on the continent. It's really not where Kenya needs to be, but it is definitely a, a positive. Do you think Kenya can achieve this in 2021? Absolutely. Look, uh, we think, of course, Kenya can. And most of the time, I would say for, for most of it, most of these 
forecast, their, their forecast. And um, most times, uh, African continents do supersede that because we forget to put in the informal sectors that are not calculated in this kind of forecast. Mm -hmm. So from what the, the president is doing, uh, definitely, definitely, Kenya is going to surpass that. Oh. One of the big factors that those affect uh, most countries in Africa is, is when there's elections. And, and Kenya has done past that. There's not going to be an election in the next coming years. So there's, there's good political stability. Mm. So we have no doubt that Kenya is going to come out dry, especially tapping into the digital economy the way they have been. Okay, still talking Kenya now, just like any other African country as we've seen in recent times, Kenya still has a very large appetite for loans despite increasing taxes with their Finance Act of 2020. Can we see East Africa's largest economy maintain an edge despite owing more than 60 billion US dollars in debt? Look, we understand there's been a lot of cry across the continent about the kind of debt. Yes. Um, most African countries are going into, especially with China. Uh, for one, we we have engaged on, on different levels on, on African countries not taking this debt as sole entities as one country because mm -hmm. they, they're going against very large economies like China, the EU, and the US. So Africa has to come together as one to go for these deals. Mm -hmm. But but to say, when, when we look at Kenya, uh, you know, when you take these loans, you have to balance your books. You know, you have to find where, where's, the, where's the repayment going to come from. And one of the ways are uh, taxes. Unfortunately, it has to happen. And if you look at Kenya in the last 10 years, most of these loans they have taken and which they needed to grow any economy, they have used those funds for the infrastructure. Mm. What we, we are against is using those loans uh, for personal gains, for corruption. That's where the problem comes. But I know because we have worked closely with the Kenya Tax um, uh, Distribution Agency, they've been able to distribute, of course, looking at um, how to bring people out of poverty, which happens a lot in Africa. But these funds have been able to distribute, been distributed equitably. Mm. And so we are very hopeful that Kenya will come out. Um, they, need, they need a loan. You need the investment. We need the capital in these countries. Yeah. And one of the ways uh, to get your people educated, to develop your infrastructure, you need those loans. But the most important thing is to keep it at bay and to make sure they use for infrastructure to drive the economy to grow in the coming years. Okay, makes sense. So let's move away from Kenya now. Uh, Nigeria and South Africa were already in troubled waters before the lockdown came about because of the coronavirus pandemic. Both nations have made several policy adjustments in order to boost their economies. Now, starting with South Africa, the power utility ESCOM has been one of the main issues affecting the growth prospects of the country. Liberalization of generation capacity has eased this to an extent, as well as a fight from uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa on corruption. But quickly, how much blame would you actually lay at the feet of ESCOM for where South Africa's economy is, given the fact that ESCOM has about a 464 billion rand debt hanging over its head? Look, we must understand quickly, just to take you back, where, where some of these problems emanated from. In 2005, South Africa rand was about five to a dollar. At the time, the population, a large population of the, of the country said they were not benefiting in this strong value of the rand. They mm -hmm. wanted it to be weak and they opted for a different kind of president. Then the country had Tabo and Becky. Mm -hmm. And they opted for someone like Zuma, who was populist, who could bring uh, development to rural areas and all of that. And, and because of this, there was an uh, uprise uh, for, for, for in the labor market. Um, uh, a minimum wage and all this cries. And it, this triggered down and it brought about well, the saga that happened in 2012, which was called the Maricana saga, mm. where the mines, uh, which was a big driver of the economy, the mines, the miners were, were insisting that they were not partaking in their economy. And because of this, there was a, a massacre of the miners. Uh, they wanted a pay raise and this okay. affected uh, investment not to come in direct investment into the mining sector and this started triggering the economy downwards we must remember 
And that, just just to, to take it very quickly, and that went on politically, affecting the president, affecting the status quo, and South Africa saw a decline in its economy. Mm. And it led, you know, in 2016, where the president uh, removed the finance minister, and that was, that was, that was very terrible because the Iran took a beating. It went to almost 20, uh, to a dollar and billions of, of, of billions. All right, I think some technical issues there, but we will definitely get our guests back on the line. Looking at South Africa now, Kenya, South Africa, and Nigeria are expected to post some form of economic growth in the coming year. According to the World Bank's uh, reports, prospects, uh, the January report for prospects 2021. We'll take a quick time out. When we come back, the conversation continues. Stay with us. This is still Business Edge right here on New Central. We're talking World Bank's global prospects for January 2021, putting Kenya, South Africa, and Nigeria on the path of positive growth. My guest is still with me, and we're focusing on South Africa now. So let's get to a very vital question that is not just about South Africa, but many other African nations. Um, Ikos, can you tell us, do you believe there's political will uh, genuinely and sincerely in South Africa in order to do what needs to be done? Absolutely, there's a, there's a political will, and this was reiterated by the president on Friday. Mm. Uh, there was a January 8th statement of the ANC, which the president of South Africa made it very clear that South Africa has to come out of this and create growth. Uh, South Africa was hoping that last year was going to be the year that it could transform after its elections in 2019. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we had COVID that tried to put us back in the coffin. But the political will is there, not within a doubt. The only problem we have, because the country is divided into, you know, those who have benefited in the economy in the past and those who want to come and participate in the economy, which is a majority of the people. So, but the president has to meet it between those two to get a balance. And I think we have the right president. He's doing all he can, and he has made it very clear. Although he has made it clear that COVID is the most important thing to tackle now and to to kickstart the economy. Okay, so you talked about kickstarting the economy and the growth. So South Africa's growth is expected to rebound to about 3.3% in 2021. That's 0 0.7 percentage points um, below what it was before. And then it's supposed to land at around 1.7% in 2022. Where will this rebound come from? Just like the Kenya uh, question, where will the growth, where do you anticipate this growth coming from? Yes. Okay. Well, what is important, we most recognize that when, when we had the pandemic COVID hit, all debts in Africa were suspended. Mm. What is required for most African states is to pay the interest. So we, we, we definitely, that's a good relief. Okay. And second of all, before we were hit, uh, uh, the president of South Africa went around the world in the Middle East, and he set up an infrastructure fund to raise a lot of money. Because what the president has realized to kickstart any economy is infrastructure. Government is not supposed to get involved in business. What government does is to create the environment to be enabling. Yes. And one of the things is to woo investors and raise money. And we believe that this infrastructure fund, uh, once it is begin to level out, which we are seeing now, the infrastructure fund was about 50 billion and it was expected to grow to $120, $120 billion uh, uh, fund. This will help to drive the economy. And also, because there's no election, and the, the, the politics is getting more stable now, mm -hmm. especially because of the, 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 the COVID. We expect this will you know, reduce the tension and will help South Africa get its rating. One of the big problems South Africa has with its ratings was that it had many downgrades in the last few years. Yeah. And so a lot of capital outflow left South Africa. So we need to get back this rating by, by doing the right things and then also reform the labor market and the economy, which is on the way as we speak. Okay, just a few more questions. Now let's talk about the cost of living across Sub-Saharan Africa, and that has increased more with recession, particularly in South Africa and Nigeria. 
but these are not the only nations that have increased their taxes. We're seeing conversation across the continent from governments who are trying to expand their tax nets, bring more people in to pay taxes, but we're also seeing populations that don't have as much money in their pockets and they're feeling the pinch of increased taxes. Is there a middle ground in this regard very quickly? I think this middle ground, to be honest, you know, sometimes we find ourselves in very difficult situations and we have to take difficult measures. Yeah. Sometimes Africans have to realize that, you know, these loans, these facilities we get, we have to pay it back. And if you go back in history, if you look at uh, uh, South Korea, for example, there were times where they had to pay a lot of tax and people had to get pay costs for, for betterment of the future generation. I think that that has to be honest, it has to be transparent, but it's necessary. We have to pay taxes, we have to pay our fair share. Mm. And, and these taxes, we, we don't want to say it's only Africa. If you look across Europe and uh, the US and even in Asia, the taxes are, are going high. But what we are saying, especially in, in South Africa, is that we need to get more people accountable to pay tax. Because mm. what we find out in Africa with our survey, is that a lot of Africans are not willing to pay the income taxes and feel they should not be taxed. And only a small percentage has been carrying that burden of taxes. Yeah. So with new technology, I still think they will not feel the pinch, but governments, either directly or indirectly, they have to tax because this money has to come from somewhere. And I think it's a level playing ground. But once there's trust between the citizens mm. and the government, and they can see the benefit they, they reap the benefits of those taxes, which the government have to show their people. I think it's fair. Okay, so lastly and very quickly, uh, we've seen vaccines roll out outside of the continent, and there are many who are anxiously awaiting for vaccines to arrive on the continent. What role do you see the rollout of vaccines playing in the em um, economic growth projections of Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, and the rest of Africa? Will we see this growth if we don't see vaccines on the continent? Very quickly, please. Yeah, very quickly, I think uh, we were very worried when this vaccine were rolling out. For yeah. example, the president did say, South African president said on Friday that he spoke to the Canadian president, they had all that long time ago and paid for vaccines, and they, they, they're still behind to get vaccines delivered. So we knew uh, for sure that vaccines would take time to come to Africa and poorer countries. But what the AU, African Union, has done through the COVAX has been able to secure some vaccines and we expect these vaccines to start to be delivered somewhere around May or sooner. South Africa has done a good job uh, with the Solidarity Fund to be able to, to get the, uh, the civil society to contribute the fund to be able to pay for some vaccines. And South Africa is receiving 1 million uh, doses of vaccine from India this month. South Africa is also producing a vaccine which will be ready in June with Johnson & Johnson and uh, the South African University. So we, we hope, and the, because the South African president chairs the African Union, yeah. he has promised uh, most countries in the continent to have access to this vaccine. And he has been on it. Uh, there's a joint sitting with uh, the World Health Organization where for our countries, especially in Africa, we get access to this vaccine. So far, it's looking a little bit bleak, but we are very hopeful because we can't get one part in the world getting vaccines and leaving the other part of the world, Africa, behind. And so there's been political promise and will and with the new U.S. administration, we believe that that will go smoothly and poorer countries in Africa will have access to vaccine and be able to kickstart or restart their economy, depending on which we are talking about. Fantastic way to end the conversation. Thank you so much to my guest. Um, I've had Ikos Akpoko Bayan, Chief Investment Officer for Ovid Capital, based in Johannesburg, South Africa, joining me. We've been looking at a New World Bank report that puts economic prospects for three of Africa's powerhouse economies on the, po on the positive trajectory for 2020. Thank you so much for joining me, and we look forward to having you back. Oh, thank you so much. All right, you know what we do next, and that is NC4 to watch. Here are a few stories we're keeping our eyes on, and probably you should be watching out for too. Communications and Digital Technologies Minister Stella Indabeni Abrahams has come to the defense of government's plan to extend the payment of television license fees to viewers who watch DSTV and Netflix on their mobile devices. She was responding to parliamentary questions after the draft white paper on audio and audiovisual content services policy framework was published for comment. 
The draft white paper was published at a time that the SABC license fee revenue decreased in 2019-2020 by 177 million rand from the previous financial year. The African Development Bank has announced plans to provide $5 billion over the next five years in a move that seeks to see women enterprises scale up their businesses. According to the bank, the first pillar contained in its gender strategy 2021 to 2025 will ensure women entrepreneurs benefit from enhanced credit access and technical assistance in business model development, financial and business planning as well. It seeks to transform them into productive and competitive enterprises. Gold has extended its largest drop in two months amid a strong dollar as metal traders weigh President-elect Joe Biden's pledge on his strategy in helping the world's largest economy. Spot gold dropped as much as 0.7% to 1,836.30 cents an ounce at the Asian trading session. And finally, the National Bureau of Statistics reports that over 205 million Nigerian telephone subscribers on voice calls were active in the third quarter of 2020. It disclosed this in its just released Telcom's data for the second and third quarters of 2020, which focused on active voice and internet per state, porting, and tariff information. And that's it on this edition of Business Edge. Follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. Head to our website and also download our mobile app on Play Store and iOS. Until next time, I'm Tolu Lokwe, Adelaru Balogun.